Backcode is something that will hunt you for years. And I'm sure you know that feeling when returning to piece of code that you just have written a few months ago and it looks like an AI build it only using the last answer from every stack overflow thread. In this video I will show you four easy techniques to avoid that feeling and make you fall in love with your code once again, also one year after you've written it. I know often in the world of data science and ML code quality is not as important as in software engineering, but still it is very important and given how little effort you have to put in sometimes it pays off many times over over in time saved in the future. At the end of this video I will show you some actionable tools and IDE tricks that will make your code two times better in minutes, so definitely stay tuned for that. Number one. KISS. Keep it simple and stupid. Or if you know the Agile Manifesto, maximize the amount of work you don't do. Keep it simple and stupid means make it as simple as possible. In other words, don't build a neural network when one if case is 90% of the work. Once you get into moving ML into production, you will find that there are hundreds if not millions of ways to get things done. And you can refactor it in just as many ways and at some point it becomes unmanageable when you or other people are doing things things in a different way and then you try to make your model API interact with normal programming teams code and you start slowing each other down. Or you read code that somebody else has written or you yourself some while ago and you find that you are not able to reuse a lot of this code or feature preprocessing which just ends up with you writing 80% of the same code all over again. If you keep your function small and simple, the chance of someone reusing it for a similar use case in the future is just so much bigger than when you have 10 parameters that anyway always use the same default value. So keep your code as simple and as consistent as possible. This will help you avoid bugs, avoid hours of debugging and help you refactor and adapt to changes faster. And just makes you so much faster in the long run. Number two, style guides and explicit type annotations. PEP8 sounds like some knockoff soft drink, but actually it stands for Python Enhancement Proposal and it is the one Python style guide that you really have to follow. PEP8 defines how you should write your code, in other words, how do you name your variables, your functions and various other things that you can name while programming Python. Additionally, it specifies how many spaces and tabs should be around brackets. And you maybe now think, what is the point? And the point is readability. If all code looks the same, you will be a lot less confused when reading someone else's code or when you look at code that you wrote years ago. I will show you in the end how you can easily enforce this in your IDE and not have to do anything, but for now let's just look at some examples. PEP8 is the standard style guide for Python and it's a thing that also comes up in um, interview questions a lot, so if somebody asks you what is PEP8, you know what it is. Now, we'll go through some examples. The first very bad thing I see a lot of people do is this, you know, they specify a variable name and they just call it X. I mean, you're from the world of machine learning and I am, so we can I know it's probably the features, but um, please at least go and say it's X train, so we at least know it's not the X for the test set. If you write production code, I think it's even better if you say features train or features train data frame. Remember, more explicit is better because when you see this code again in a year, you really already know what it is. Next thing is descriptive function names. So this is another thing many people do, they kind of think they're so efficient and they just kind of write two letter functions and then somehow expect that somebody will know what it means. Of course, this is maybe pre-processing or whatever it stands for, but maybe a better example would be replacing missing values. Good names that describe them well is already a good part of documentation itself. Next thing in Python is here, this uh, spacing thingy. This is how you should not write code and this is kind of how you should space your code. It's really easy to do, you just configure an auto format. The more Pythonic way, of course this runs, you can absolutely check if something is true by writing equals equals true, but this is not the most Pythonic way, you would rather say I if my bull. The other example that I think is very common and that you see often done wrong on the internet is this uh, if not something is none. Uh, you also sometimes see is equals equals none or all strange things. But really the right one is if someone is not none. So this is the difference here and actually um, PyCharm even tells you that this is not PyPA pay, pay conform and you should not do it this way. Let's also now look at type hints. And what are type hints? Type hints are 
something that's not really enforced in Python, but they describe the data type of your parameters in a function now, for example. You write here a double dot and then Python and especially your IDE will know what data type this function is expecting as a first argument. Now you have this concept here of union. Um, in Python 10 you can actually write it like this now, I think. Uh, so then it will be like this. But this is not available until Python 3.10, so you maybe have to wait a bit until this becomes live in most environments. Anyway, what is a union? A union just really means it's either a float or it's int. Great. Now here it becomes a bit more important because now you know you kind of can give this parameter the non-value or you can give it an int, so the random state. And it's kind of important because that means if you don't want to specify random random state and you want to get a different result every time you run the function then you want the non parameter and else you want some explicit seed and kind of make uh, your results reproducible. The last thing we cover here is this return parameters, you, what this function returns and here it actually returns two data frames. Uh, this is then written as a tuple of uh, pandas data frame and pandas data frame. If we go now into a function and see what this is actually useful for and we see here, hey, on Friday afternoon I typed the argument somehow in the wrong order and you know PyCharm will automatically tell you no, it's kind of int this one and you want the data frame and maybe you should switch up these two things. The other very useful thing is if we look here at the documentation of the function and we see that these things have types and we kind of already by the types know a lot about this function and maybe don't even need to look at the documentation. Number three, complexity. While complexity can have many meanings in machine learning from model complexity to co-complexity, the goal is always to reduce it as much as possible. As much as possible means keep it as simple as you can. In machine learning this can mean using fewer parameters. If a simpler model can do the job well enough, use that one and not a fancy deep learning model. Of course, if your business case is so valuable that 1% better is worth millions, a very complicated architecture might be justified and it will always remain a trade-off, so keep that in mind. A different form of complexity is business complexity. It is the one you should worry about at the beginning of a project the most. This complexity will always exist through having many stakeholders and having strange processes and interfaces to different technology stacks and that you cannot change on the fly. Let's think about an example where you have to build a classifier to split emails to different routes. Would it maybe be easier to just have three different email domains people send their respective classes to? It depends. Sometimes your stakeholders can handle this and sometimes it is too much of a hassle. While business engineers should handle these type of process complexities, you should always remember that what we talked about in the beginning. Maximize the amount of work you don't do and critical thinking from your side on this topic is also useful, even if it's not in your job description. Infrastructure and deployment complexity concerns how you deliver your machine learning model to the user. In other words, how can you keep your systems running as simple as possible. Usually here you have to consider whether you want to work with batch processing or online processing. Batch processing in praxis means that you once a day, a month or whatever time frame predict something for each customer. And online processing is when someone calls your API and you immediately process your data pipeline with one sample and return the predicted value immediately. Trust me when I say you always want to use batch processing. Yeah, API sounds cool, but massive parallel processing always wins and monitoring and pretty much everything is just so much easier to implement if you do batch. Now unless you're working for a history department people tend to like that slightly annoying forecasting part we sometimes do and they kind of want to know what we think right now which well means APIs. Uh, there are also some mixed forms of this like computing the expensive steps per day like seasonality trends and then only doing the necessary parts of the prediction in an online fashion, like considering what the specific customer has clicked on in his user session. So make sure to think a lot about how much you really need to do live. The last aspect of complexity I want to mention is mental complexity and that means keeping your code simple to understand for others and yourself in the future really. 
Use less if cases, keep a clear program flow and don't split each mini use case into its own individual program flow with its own set of functions that are mostly copy paste anyway. Remember reducing and managing complexity is your job and do it as good as you can. But it's a lifelong learning process and don't feel too bad about it when you realize at the end of your project that you could have done it simpler. Instead analyze and keep growing. For commenting. Okay, I admit it at four o'clock on Friday I also write brain dead things like this and if this is your approach to commenting you won't gain anything instead as Damien Conway described it documentation is a love letter that you write to your future self and like on any dating app if you write texts that make you fall asleep you will hate that person instead describe why you make a specific design decision describe what business requirements get fulfilled at this point or what this part is only needed during training or exists for debugging or monitoring purposes only. Just today a colleague asked why some function I wrote some time ago had no permission to write to that table and after looking up my old code the answer was in the documentation of the fur parameter which taught me well that he did not look up the functions documentation once before contacting me but in all seriousness it helped me solve this issue in one minute instead of 60 minutes. To learn how to document I would suggest looking at great open source documentations like pandas or numpy and just learn how they do. I get that there is no point in document every little analysis function that will never be used again but if you feel that you will touch this code again more than once definitely put a few hints for your future self. How to comment such that you can really benefit we'll look at right now. Okay let's shortly look at commenting style guidelines. So I copied here a function from NumPy and we'll look at three different style guidelines. It doesn't really matter which one you use just kind of settle for one and I think they're all pretty great. I think now especially for data scientists and machine learning this NumPy style guide is pretty decent because it's both in Pandas and in NumPy which are two of the biggest libraries I tend to use for a lot of my time and work. Now generally you have here uh, three arguments, I cut it a little and um, the first thing you describe usually is here what the function does and it returns a value at the given quantile over a requested axis. Now here for you have three arguments, this Q, this axis and the numeric only with the type hint. I think actually you can save here the first line in the NumPy uh, style guide and this actually kind of describes what it is. But uh, yeah, here it still is in and that was, I think, introduced in a time before type hints were a thing. That's why we looked at it before. Great. Now then you describe each uh, parameter and what they're used for and that's about it. Then you have a very important section, the return section, which is where people mostly care about what is it this function returns and how am I continuing with my workflow knowing about these things and um, depending on what parameters I gave there. So this was the NumPy style guide and then there's a very similar one which is the restructure uh, style guide which is the default for Python. So I think this style guide is a bit better suited if you're, um, I don't know, doing a lot of DevOps, a lot of normal Python programming and data science maybe not at the heart of your program. But again, I think it's all kind of up to choice. The main difference here is that it's a bit shorter. It doesn't describe the data types in so much uh, precision as above, but I think especially for uh, data science purposes, these data types and a bit extended documentation on what values are considered legal and so on are um, in there. Then, uh, however, it's a bit shorter than the NumPy documentation. The last one I want to cover is the Google style guide. So this is the one uh, Google used for all its library. It's also becoming very popular. Um, it's a bit shorter, I think, here. Um, it's just as good as the others, I think, uh, yeah. In the end, I'll show you how to configure this for your individual project. You'll just choose one, whatever you like is best. I would just recommend that you all use the same in your team. Okay, to wrap this thing up, let's make you better in a few minutes and just make you code more productively, especially here with PyCharm. You will have these same options in many other IDEs, so just look for them or Google for them and you will find them. First thing we notice here, this function looks really ugly. So what you can you do? You can press Ctrl Alt, Ctrl Shift L in my case and boom, it's out formatted. It's beautiful and it's easy. You can easily configure all of this on the fly. The other way here in PyCharm is Ctrl L, uh, Ctrl A select everything and then hit here under code, reformat code and put it on some key shortcut that you really press every, I don't know, I press it really like spam wise, like all 30 seconds. 
just such that I never have to spend time reformatting my code. Easy as that. Next thing we'll look at is how to get this commenting done very fast. So in my case, you just do it like this and you automatically have some NumPy uh, state up style guide here where you can just comment your code easily and nicely. So how do you set this up in PyCharm is really easy. You go under settings, you go under here under tools, Python integration tools, and you will easily have here the doc string and you can set it to whatever you want. Let's set it to Google, for example. Um, okay, last but not least, my favorite plugin, which is Sonar Lint. You can use it for any programming language, not just Python, and it just gives you so many actionable um, on-the-fly code reviews that are really cool. So how do you get this plugin? It's really simple. You go to the settings again, and then you go under plugins, and you can type here in Sonar Lint, and you can directly install it, and also a lot of other plugins for that matter. So what is Sonar Lint? Sonar Lint is like an automatic code review tool that just monitors your code while you're typing. We have here now a really bad function and we see what's all wrong with it if we look down here. So it gives you this um, classification of bugs or code smells as they call it. So you have major code smells which are things you really should solve and like minor code smells which kind of make the code a little bit less nice. The cool thing is it really gives you feedback. So here the first thing is specify an exception class to catch or raise the error. I don't know so you would write something like here here, um, type error or something like that and it would be happy I mean this is a stupid function so there cannot actually be any errors but it will give you these little feedbacks while you're coding um, remove this unused function parameter of course um, it's kind of stupid because we have here a function where we don't need it and it will just make you aware of these redundant parameters or things that kind of got outdated while you were coding and it kind of removed it and will just keep your code so much cleaner so I highly encourage you to use this tool so this has it been with me for the week again and I hope you enjoyed it and you got more productive while coding like and subscribe and um, see you next week